going live. I have to make sure it says it's good. Yes. Awesome. Okay. All right. We are now live. Thank you guys for joining us in the I Believe podcast. Um, I'm here with Alec McKenzie, and I'm going to introduce him in just a couple seconds. So um, briefly, just thank you again to everyone who's participated in the last couple of walks that we had, the Looking for a Cure um, it was great to have everybody get together and we're so excited for next year. So be on the lookout for literally look out, um, for the looking for a cure ocular melanoma in your area. We have quite a few walks coming up in the future. Um, major kind of things coming up this next week or so giving Tuesday is on Tuesday next week on the 29th. And we would love for you to host a social media based fundraiser for ocular melanoma, um, a cure insight so that we can, you know, continue to raise awareness, raise funds for um, ocular melanoma, especially utilizing the tool of social media. So if you have not done that yet, head to our YouTube channel and look up social media for OMIs or social media 101 for OMIs. And I actually made a video. I did a short workshop where you can go and you can learn about uh, how to use social media, how to make a fundraiser. And we also talk about the I Give campaign on Charity Footprints. So if you are not someone who wants to use social media, you're welcome to jump over there and utilize that platform instead. Um, I know social media can be conflicting for some people. <laughs> we don't all like it and that's okay. Um, so if you guys have any questions, please reach out to us. Uh, you can reach out to contact at a cure insight with questions, or you can reach out directly to me here on social media and I will you know, try my best to answer your questions. Um, save the date kind of for the end of December. We are going to be doing steps for sight again. We have some big announcements coming with that. So stay tuned and just know that that's coming. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we need to cover right now. I don't think there's anything else. Like giving Tuesday is on Tuesday next week. Please help us make a fundraiser on social media and you will have done your part to help be an advocate for ocular melanoma. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. So I was able to get in touch with Alec uh, here on Facebook. And I think we're also on Instagram. Like we follow each other on Instagram, but, uh, Alec is a, I mean, he's kind of a TikTok legend, I think in the ocular melanoma community. <laughs> and, um, he's from San Mateo, California, where he lives with his husband and his two kids. And he has the whole week off for school for Thanksgiving this week. I'm like floored. This is amazing. <laughs> um, so Alec, why don't you tell us a little about yourself and like just your life? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me on. And uh, as Danae just said, my name is Alec McKenzie, and I live in San Mateo, which is just south of San Francisco here in California. Um, I have an awesome husband and two kids who are two sons who are 16 and 10 years old who are about to turn 11 and 17. Uh, I am a teacher. I've been a teacher. I'm in my 30th year of teaching. I teach uh, English and Spanish at the middle school level. This year, just all English, but I'm usually uh, double duty. And uh, I've spent my entire life here, almost my entire life here on the San Francisco Peninsula. So I have a nice, big, supportive group of friends and family really close by. So um, that's a little bit about me. Sorry, I muted myself for a second. No worries. <laughs> and then I tried to talk and nothing happened. Um, <laughs> okay, well, Alec, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your willingness. And just a special shout out to you for last week. I think it was last weekend during the yeah. San um, Santa Monica run. Your family and your family and friends, uh, I think, had the highest fundraiser for ocular melanoma that weekend for the run. So thank you for all of the, the support that you have you know, created for within this community. So... Can you tell us just briefly, like, let's just kind of go back to the beginning, you know, three and a half years ago, you were diagnosed with OM. Um, what happened? Like what led to this diagnosis for you? So I was one of those people who I really had no warning. I, I look back and there were little hints here and there, maybe, but I, uh, my husband and I went away for a nice weekend, got a cabin out in the woods. It was pouring rain all weekend. And I just brought a pile of books and read, and I read for like two days straight. And on the third day, I woke up in the morning and half of my sight was blocked in one of my eyes. It was like a shade had been pulled down from the top and I could see kind of blurry through the bottom and just gray through the top. And so I kind of worried at first, maybe I strained my eyes because I read so much the days before that maybe I messed up my eye. And then my I, I get pink eye once in a while because I'm a teacher. So I thought maybe it's pink eye, it was a little goopy, but I don't know. Anyway, so I Hazards went to the doctor. Of the job. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> we pick like. up every germ. 
Um, so I went to the urgent care near us thinking I was just going to get drops for pink eye. And the doctor took one look at it and was like, oh, no, we need to refer you up to a, an eye doctor. So I, she got me in for an emergency appointment and they took a, a bunch of preliminary pictures. And that doctor, looking back, I know could tell I had a tumor there, but didn't want to confirm it. And uh, so he referred me to an ocular oncologist the next day who did all the the uh, scans and the ultrasounds and all that. And I then that day I got the diagnosis that I had a very large ocular melanoma tumor in my right eye that was, it had gotten so big it was detaching the retina and that's what the vision loss was about. That's why my sight had changed. So it literally, I went I went to bed one night with 20-20 vision and, and gl with my glasses, 20-20 vision. And I woke up the next morning with half sight in one eye. It just happened overnight with no warning to me. Um, looking back, there were some signs, like I said, of, over the six months or so previous, I, I had had these weird sensations that there was like a person standing next to me on that side. And I would always catch myself going like, who, and there would be nobody there. And I realize now that that was probably some sort of flashing thing that was going on, which is a common symptom. Um, and I also noticed that I, I'm a runner. And when I would run on my treadmill every once in a while, I'd find myself losing my balance more than normal and having to hold on to the bars, which I never used to do. And maybe those were signs, I'll never know. But um, I, I, to me, it felt like there was no warning. I wasn't one of those people that they were monitoring or watching for long periods of time. It just happened. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's... <laughs> I feel like it's like a catch 22. Like, is there really a, a preference, right? In this kind of a scenario, would you rather just be blindsided and told like, oh, here's a tumor, yeah. never had anything to, to give you warning of this in the future or in the past. And then the flip side of that is someone who maybe has a nevus who is being monitored for four years before something is changing. Um, I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I don't know. I've only experienced the the first where right. I was blindsided and it was like, surprise. Yeah, me too. Right. Um, so I, like, I can't relate to anything else, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess if I, if I could go back, I guess if I could go back and pick knowing what I know now about the diagnosis and about the prognosis, I would rather it have been monitored way earlier, <laughs> but it just, it wouldn't have been possible with where my tumor was. Yeah. Um, so I think, that's one I, of those sucky if, realities, right? To like yeah. acknowledge that. <laughs> I think if I had a choice, I, I think I'd prefer it the way I had it because part of our disease is that there's so much uncertainty and to add mm -hmm. those years of uncertainty to the uncertainty would have just been an extended uncertainty. So as horrible as true. getting hit over the head was, that was just a, a miserable experience that I don't wish on anybody, obviously, but, um, but it is, you know, then it's all in one time and you, you, you know, it, there isn't that uncertainty. You definitely have been diagnosed. So yeah. I guess, you know, it, th there's good sides to both. <laughs> well, I know, um, I know as a result of, you know, a larger tumor, the aggression of treatment tends to be, it, it just tends to be a little more aggressive, right? So what exactly did you have done for treatment? So my ocular oncologist who turned out to be one of the most awesome ones. Everybody's telling me I have a great one. I didn't even know. I just got lucky and got assigned to him. And um, I see Dr. Muthranjaya through the Stanford Health um, in, down in Palo Alto near us. Um, he's the one who diagnosed it. And on the day of the diagnosis, when he came in the room to tell me I had a large tumor, he very quickly after that told me that his suggestion was to enucleate the eye right away. Um, he said that the tumor was so large that radiation was not going to kill all of it. And that even if it did start that process, that it, it was going to be years and years probably of misery of shots and pain and swelling and because the tumor was so big. He said if the tumor had been smaller, then we would have had a different conversation. But um, I, I never looked back after that. I trusted him. I didn't go for a second opinion. I, I very quickly learned through the grapevine. I had the one of the best ocular oncologists in the United States, maybe even more than that. And I, I put my faith and trust in him um, and he did a great job. So I, I was offered a nucleation. That was the, the main um, uh, treatment. And about three weeks after my initial diagnosis, I had my right eye enucleated. Crazy. Oh, it's like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's crazy to me sometimes the differing timeline because you hear about some people who have their eye enucleated and they had, they had like a two day span. It was like two days later, their doctor's yeah. like, we gotta, we gotta schedule surgery now. Yeah. And then you have other people who they wait for three weeks or two weeks. And, and it's, it's just interesting. Like 
there is some sense of obviously some sense of urgency, but it's it's really interesting to me to see the the difference between just different doctors and like how some mm-hmm. some of them treat it with more urgency than others. And I think ultimately you're here now and that's yeah. what matters. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Three and a half years later, here I yeah, am. Exactly. So. I, I so, no complaints um, about the treatment right now. I'm assuming just because your eye was enucleated that you were able to then have some pretty extensive testing done on your tumor. Um, so did you end up having a biopsy? And if so, like, would you be willing to share like what those results of the biopsy were? For sure. Yeah. So I did uh, that. My eye was sent away to, I don't remember, at Castle or, you know, Castle one of the places that does yeah. all of, all of that testing. Um, and it took a while to get the results back. I wasn't ready for that. I thought I'm used to like testing coming back at least within a week or so. And this was, it felt like a month or two, maybe more. Um, I came back as a class 1B, I think as most people listening to this know, they're, right now they classify them into three different classes of 1A, 1B, and 2. Um, and I came back as a class 1B and I came back as PRAME positive. Um, and so it puts me in this really, we were talking about uncertainty earlier with this whole diagnosis that, you know, it's like 1B is is relatively good news to get, you know, it, and it's, it. My doctor was like, this is, you know, this is good news, but it's not 1A, which would be better news. And the yeah. fact that it's praying positive also. So, um, and then as I, as I went through my journey, I realized those letters and numbers don't necessarily mean a whole lot that there are some, they're, they're guidelines for sure, but there are some people who fall into those categories who don't fit what those categories are supposed to mean, obviously. So, um, so it just... You know, it creates a lot of uncertainty. Uh, lots of things do, and um, it was a good learning lesson for this guy who likes a lot of control. <laughs> I'm a control freak, and I like to plan and predict and know what's happening. And you can't do that with this. So, so my diagno- the the um, the biopsy results and all that came back, and you know, just created a lot more doubt and uncertainty in my mind. But um, that's what I live with. So that, that's yeah, where for we sure. are. Yeah. No, I just, you, you said something about like, you know, they're like guidelines and I just had that flash from Pirates of the Caribbean. Like they're more like guidelines anyway. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry. My well, brain I mean, does fun things they, with movies. I think it's I, a lot of us patients obviously want to put ourselves, we want to know the numbers and the statistics and the data. And is it good news or bad news? And is it, you know, it, uh, that's human, I think. And especially when it's a, a disease as serious as cancer can be, we, we want to know. And Unfortunately, because our disease is so is relatively unknown and rare, we don't have as many answers for it as others might. So yeah. um, it does create this whole aspect of living with this disease. And what I was going to say earlier, too, is losing your sight at the same time. You know, there are other mm-hmm. cancers where you're diagnosed with cancer and you obviously are dealing with that burden and those treatments and everything. But with our cancer, we also have that plus a loss of sight for many of us, um, if, especially if you're enucleated, right? So it's like, oh, I have cancer, let that sink in. And then three three weeks later, now I'm going to lose my sight forever on that side. And it just sort of one of those things where it, it's a double whammy. So yeah. Oh, it's, you're right. It's it's a lot of, a lot of things to adjust to. Yeah. Um, and a lot of things to adjust to in a very short amount of time. Yep. Which <laughs> is, I mean, it, it's kind of, I feel like it's mind blowing sometimes. Uh, to people who, you know, maybe observe this happen on the outside, right? They see, oh, you got diagnosed with an eye tumor. Oh, your eye has now been, you know, enucleated or treated with plaque. And then, then there's this level of expectation of like, okay, but like, you'll be fine. And it's like, You're, right? It's yeah, gone. yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> except that like now I'm adjusting to everything and this sucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I, do you feel like your diagnosis has kept you from doing anything kind of in those initial years? Like kept you from, from feeling present or from being able to, I don't know, like, like you mentioned balance was kind of an issue on your treadmill. Like, did you have an adjustment period with just physically being able to kind of get back to where you, you wanted to be? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it took a while after the surgery, just, yeah, that's a major surgery. You know, I, you have a body part removed. I'm sorry if that's graphic, but that, that's how it is. And your body has to take time to heal. Um, I, I was lucky after my nucleation, I had a really quick recovery. I, I credit my, my surgeon, my ocular oncologist, Dr. M for, for most of that. Um, he just did such a great job with, with all of it and with keeping me updated on my checkups and making sure I had everything I needed. Um, I, I guess I just thought that this surgery sounded so horrific to me at first that I just figured like, 
I'm done. Like, I'm not going to be able to work. I'm not going to be able to raise my kids. I'm going to be blind on one side. I'm going to go through life falling down and hitting things and injuring myself. And it, like life as I know it is all done. But as I was recovering, I slowly realized like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I can still do almost every single thing I could do before. And I, I don't want to be that person that just shuts down because my eye doesn't work anymore. So um, so I made a point after, it, it, I would say after about three or four weeks of recovery is when I felt human again, in term, just physically, you know, after getting over a surgical procedure and everything. And I made it a point of jumping back in. I went back to work full-time, full-time teaching all day long. I started driving again. I drove my kids all over the place. We, you know, I... I got back into life, family events, traveling, all, all the stuff that we used to do, I still do. I think there are very few things I can't do now that I could do before. Just a couple examples are depth perception things. So we go to a family camp every summer where there's a ping pong table. And my first year <laughs> after I had my surgery, my sons and I would play ping pong once in a while. And there's just no way. It's almost comical. It's like people think I'm doing it on purpose, how badly I miss the ball. Um, I used to love like ping that. pong and I'm like, oh, I haven't yeah. played that in a while. Maybe I should not. <laughs> and the good news is I was never the athletic sports guy to begin with. So I'm, you know, throwing and catching things and all that has never been, a, but it is a bigger deal. On um, on Friday, this past Friday at our school, we had a big dodgeball um, tournament thing happening in the eighth grade and I was down there supervising. And that's sort of like one of my nightmare situations is having projectiles <laughs> Like not Balls being able to flying. see how close. Yeah. And I can see out of the corner of my good eye, they're coming at me, but I can't really tell how. So I think those are the only things that I feel like I can't do. I run still. I can run. I, I can uh, run very slowly, but I do run. I get some exercise that way. I Yes, I bump into things all the time. I'm bruised on the right side of my body a lot of the time because I miss a corner walking around a doorway, for instance, or I forget our bookshelf is in the hallway and I bang into it. Um, so, you know, kind of hazards of that. You have to be more careful navigating around. But <laughs> yes, I also find the, life. Yeah, the people in my life, though, are very understanding. My students, they all know like backpacks can't be in the aisles while Mr. McKenzie's walking around and um people will point things out to me watch out for that curb there my husband as we're walking around in dark places that are hard to see he'll like you know let me put my hand on his shoulder as we're going downstairs and things so i i need to be more careful on some parts but i knock on wood have not had a huge wipeout yet so we'll see well, <laughs> i'm sure it's gonna I hope that doesn't point. happen for you yeah. because wipeouts are not fun <laughs> i used to I have them all the time as a teenager and i think i can uh, just blame that on like the awkwardness of teenagers yes. <laughs> because i was not i mean i had i had glasses then but i was not blind in one eye um so um i think you've kind of alluded a little bit to this but Tell us a little bit uh, about like your greatest support in your community, your family, your community. Um, who do you feel like has been some of your greatest supports? So I am, I always say I'm the luckiest guy ever. I have, I've always had support in my life. I'm one of those people who grew up with it and family and friends. And I don't um, take it for granted at all because I know a lot of people don't. So I mentioned earlier that I live in the San Francisco Bay Area and I grew up here. So all of my family, almost every family member lives within like a 20 mile radius of where I am. Some notable exceptions, hello to the LA people, but, um, and a couple other people around the US as well. But um, most of my family lives right here. So um, I have the most amazing support. And from the second I let people know about my diagnosis, everybody at school started a, a, a dinner chain where they were bringing dinners over for us for almost like a whole month. People were picking up my kids and driving them to school and home from school and to their activities and keeping them occupied on the weekends, taking them out to movies and food and stuff. I, I just, I can't say enough what an amazing support system I have around me. Obviously, I'm going to shout out two main people. My husband, I just, I, he's been through so much with me and all of this and trying to deal with kids while your husband gets a cancer diagnosis and loses his eye and can't be there and be present and having to be the one to get them ready and make sure they're fed in the morning and all that kind of stuff. And then just 
the understanding and support he gives me around this overall, like when I need space and I'm feeling down and I just need to be by myself or that kind of thing. Um, just lots of love and support from him. And then um, my best friend, Patty, who is uh, an amazing support. God, I get, I get a little uh, choked up talking about all the wonderful people in my life. Um, she's been a rock for me as well through, she moved into our house as I was recovering because DJ had to go back to work during the days. She literally slept on our living room floor and helped take care of me and my family and my kids and make sure I had everything I needed. So I, I mean, you can see, I get emotional about the amazing support I have from my parents, my siblings, everybody. So, um, I've, I've got, I, I'm very lucky that way. And I, I don't take that for granted at all. Well, I think that's amazing. And honestly, it, it, it speaks to the kind of people that, that you've surrounded yourself with and that you've had the privilege of being surrounded by and, and how important you are to them. Um, I feel like yeah. that's been one of the, the most unique aspects of this diagnosis is, you know, going through all of this is realizing like, wow, like I really am important to people. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that, that is, that's, definitely reason to be emotional. So, yeah. And I um, think there's, there's also the people that I called out and many of the others too, they, they understand. And I, I think this is important for people who are caregivers to understand that there are times I'll speak for myself at least where I just need to be upset and sad and that's okay. And there are times I need to be by myself and just be depressed and work through it on my own. And my support system does such a great job of letting me be when I need to be, but then kind of forcing me out when I need to be out and making me laugh or sending me something funny on my phone or, you know, that kind of thing too. And I think it's important to have caregivers who understand that balance of when you need people and when you need to be on your own. I'm an introvert who needs my alone time for sure a lot of the time. And um, I have people that understand that. So I appreciate that too. Well, and I'm sure you've gotten really good over the years at communicating that as well. Yeah. and just communicating your own needs. And I think that that's, that's just a, I mean, we, we haven't really talked about this yet, but that's, that's a portion of self-advocacy mm -hmm. is learning to communicate exactly what you need and why and to whom, um, you're, you know, needing that support from. So yeah. just kind of on the topic of self-advocacy, what are a couple other ways that you feel like you've learned to advocate for yourself with this diagnosis? Um, well, let's see. I think in the beginning, it was really important for me to let everyone know like, oh, I may not be able to do this because I only have one eye or I'm, I'm not going to be able to sit on this side of the room because my vision, I can't see on this side. And I, it was really important for me to let everybody know that. And then after a while, I realized like, that does, to me, that doesn't really matter. Like, in, unless it's something super important, like an eye test at the doctor where they have to know <laughs> or something. Um, I, I, I don't feel like I advocate as much for myself in that way, but in my advocacy, I think has taken the form more of supporting a cure in sight and doing fundraisers and making sure that the message gets out there that I'm bringing today to this, this webcast, I, um, it is to make sure that everybody is aware of this disease, first of all, because I spent my first 50 years of life, not having ever heard that there was an eye cancer, that it even existed. Um, and I, as I talk to other people around, they don't know that either. So to bring awareness to it, um, to bring understanding and support, and that's the kind of advocacy I do. And then um, I find myself, and I'm sure you and everybody else with OM can relate to this, advocating through the medical system as well and insurance. And um, I feel like I have become an expert in the insurance system. <laughs> We have, unfortunately, many uh, medical things going on in my household these past three or four years that have required battles with insurance companies to get things covered and advocating for my family to make sure that we get things covered that should be covered. Um, and so I do a lot of that, <laughs> lots of phone calls and emails around that, too, to make sure we get what we need. But in terms of just OM overall, I, I don't feel like... I spend a lot of my life having to advocate to make sure people understand me. I want them to understand the disease and to understand mm -hmm. what patients go through and to understand the need for research and funding. Um, no, I so think I that's do so important. That. My license that's plate so important, is pure sure. OM. So I, I drive through life literally with OM on my license plate and I have people ask me all the time what it means. Um, so that's advocacy right there too. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and I think just like you said, like learning to just, just find ways to educate others and to inform people. Uh, that's, that's one of the,
biggest ways to be an advocate for ocular melanoma um, and, and in turn for yourself, because, you know, if you're a patient with ocular melanoma and you're also educating others and fundraising or, you know, doing what you can to spread the news and talk to people about dilated eye exams and why they're important, like you are impacting the future of, of future use. Mm -hmm. um, and that's such an important thing to do and such yeah. a powerful thing to do. So, okay. I want to like get to the fun stuff. Okay. So, um, I mean, not that what we haven't talked about is fun, but no. Um, but let's talk about like, what are some of the gifts that have come to you as a result of this di diagnosis? Like, and I know specifically, you know, we're, we've alluded a little bit to your TikTok and to your social media channel and kind of the things that you kind of just took on after this diagnosis, but tell us, you know, what's, what's a gift that's come from this diagnosis? Well, I'll get, I'll get, um, I'll start a little more touchy feely and then get more specific. I, the, the gifts that this has given me is every day I wake up and I make it a point of appreciating what I have. Um, every beautiful thing I see with my one remaining eye, it's a gift to me. We, we we're driving home from a, a, a day trip we took yesterday and the light setting here in California, it was just gorgeous on all of the countryside, uh, all the landscape golden, you know, the golden state. And it, it was just gold everywhere. So th that's a gift. I, the fact that I get to sit in the car and watch that sunset and I don't know, I might wake up tomorrow morning with half my vision gone in the other eye. I, who knows? Right. And so um, I look at that as gifts, the time I get with my friends, my husband, my kids, my family, my job teaching that I love so much, my students, um, those, even though I had those things before diagnosis, they're gifts now to me, they're, they're, they're time I get with, to do all of those things. Um, but beyond that, this diagnosis has also given me the gift of kind of reassessing what's important in my life and what changes I might want to make. I have the gift of time now, you know, I was diagnosed and it as at this point has only been in my eye. So I have some, uh, I have more options than some other people do. And so I looked at my life and realized I was not happy with the way I was eating. I was not happy with my level of exercise. Um, I was not happy with the example I was setting for my kids in terms of that, in terms of um, lifestyle and that kind of thing. Um, my kids at home and my students at school too, where I feel like I'm a role model. Um, and so the other gift I feel like this disease has given me is an overhaul of all of that and um, the way that I, I think about lifestyle. And I don't know if we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but one of the changes that I made was to choose to go vegan and eat vegan and specifically a type of vegan called whole food plant based. And, um, and just dabbling in that has turned into this whole lifestyle change now, which has led to the TikTok channel that you were just um, referencing and and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and all over the place. Um, and I created this persona called the one eyed cooking guy, um, which came from lots of input from friends and family and ideas I had and things like that. And that's turned into a really fun kind of side gig that I enjoy doing um, that relates to my vegan eating. And, um, and I mix in some informational stuff about OM there too. I put in some humor, like I have a video where I went running one day and I videoed all the obstacles for people with one eye, like the scary parts <laughs> of runs, like the, the driveway cutouts that you can't really see because if you're, you're oh, yes, limited. Because it, it looks flat. Right, exactly. Or the the times when construction workers have shut down one side of the road. So it forces you to, to jaywalk across the road with only one eye looking both ways things like that. So I kind of make fun of it, but I also am educating people and showing them I have a sense of humor about it, but that you can learn about, about it at the same time. So I call it the one eyed cooking guy. And I think that's another major gift I've gotten from this whole experience is to be able to start that and um, spread easy, healthy recipes, vegan recipes to people. And I'm getting really good feedback about it. Lots of people seem to enjoy the content. And um, every time I bump into people in the outside world, they're always complimenting me on it. So um, the word's that. getting out. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And and like you said, um, or like we talked about before, social media is such a cool tool and, yeah. and it's really a, a very powerful way to, to connect with people, but also to like, to spread awareness, to talk about this and, and what a cool way to, um, I guess, kind of find, find some passion, you know, outside or maybe around your diagnosis. Right. Because, and we talked about this a little before, but like, it can be so easy to get you know, pulled into this diagnosis that none of us would have chosen, right? None of us would have picked this. Um, but you know, here we are, we're all part of this club and to, to then 
work through life and like kind of navigate it in a way that it doesn't absorb your life in a negative way, but that you mm-hmm. can then kind of, and, and not like, like you said earlier today, but like not to, not to say that you don't have the down days, that you don't feel depressed or that you don't feel sorry for yourself or feel angry about even being diagnosed with this in the beginning, you know, in the beginning, but that you don't dwell there permanently. Um, and I, I think that that just, that speaks to a lot of the work that you've done individually as a person to, to be able to like kind of turn your diagnosis into something that you can have fun with and yeah. that you can, um, be passionate about. And like, I mean, that's to me, that's what advocacy is. Like advocacy is, is having that passion and that drive to talk to other people about this so that it's not just this nameless, faceless disease so that it has your name and your face put to it. And you're important to a huge community of people. And if they understand just a little bit more about OM and then they tell someone else, like the ripple effect of that is so big. Yeah. Yeah. And you just hit the nail on the head too. The other gift that goes along with all of that is I now have an OM community. I mean, all of the people who are on the Facebook pages and the Instagram, all the people I meet at the, the fun runs and the walks at the conferences when, you know, it was down in Redondo beach in LA here in California a few years ago before COVID. Um, all of that community is another gift. I mean, I have so many resources, all of you people who, who leave comments on, on, on my Facebook or who I, you know, DM and ask questions about your process and what did your doctor say about this and what treatment were you thinking of for that? Um, I've, through a cure insight, I've been connected. Melody's connected me to people who are newly diagnosed, you know, who are kind of closer to my age, who have questions, want to talk about it, that community too. So it, all of that is a gift that all these people that I never would have met, we never would have known each other or seen each other if we didn't have this in common. And you're right, none of us want it, but as long as we have it, now look at what we have is this really tight community. I feel like I've had a whole bunch of best friends, even though I haven't met most of you in person. No, I mean, I, I can totally relate. I feel like it's, it really is, um, such a gift to know so many people as a result of this, who, who are just resilient, strong, like inspiring people who also know exactly what it's like to, Mm -hmm. you know, have those days where everything is falling apart. Yep. Um, so we talked a little about this and I just, I want to give you a chance to talk about this again. But, um, we talked about this before we went live about how, you know, you, you said you kind of feel like you, you reject this idea of being a a cancer warrior. So tell us a little about, you know, what's, what's your kind of mindset behind that? Well, you know, it's, it's, this is really individual for everybody. So just for me, I, I kind of, I, I don't love the visual of being a cancer warrior and being fierce and tough and. Um, that's just never been my personality. I, I, like I mentioned earlier, I'm not athletic. I was never really on a team where we all had to like go fight somebody to win. And I, I've never really had that mentality. I'm super competitive. <laughs> Ask my friends and family. I, I like to win for sure. But um, in terms of that tough, fierce warrior metaphor, it just doesn't fit me at all. I don't feel like I, I need to be that way around it. And I get that a lot of people do. Um, and I, I'm not saying it's that I disagree with that for them. Um, but instead I, I, I kind of feel like I approach this on a day to day basis. And there are times when, yes, I feel angry and fierce and there are days I feel like I got this and I am tough and you know, like I'm going in for scans or I'm going in to get my eye checked or whatever. And I'm like, I got this, no problem. But for me, deep inside, I really don't, you know, I, I am kind of falling apart inside in most of those situations. Um, and I think that's normal. And I, I, it's hard for me because I think a lot of people who don't have cancer try and put that fierce warrior thing on us. And like I said, for some people it fits and that's great. And I, I love to watch them take that on and run with it. But for me, it kind of feels like I'm living up to someone else's pressure they're putting on me that I kind of have to be tough and I have yeah. to be this like kill or be killed warrior. I'm not going to let cancer get me kind of person. And my truth is like, I don't know if cancer is going to get me. Like, I hope it doesn't. I hope I live a nice long life, but nobody really knows that answer right now. So for me, it's a lot of extra energy to feel fierce. And so I I don't, I don't wear that. I I feel like that's such a, that's such a powerful way to put it. Um, just, and, and we talked, you know, we talked a little about this before, but 
but just, just that idea that like, it's going to look different for everyone, but that at the end of the day, you know, all of us are showing up to a fight we didn't ask to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't ask for, you know, none of us asked for this and, and, um, (laughs) and just because, you know, just because some days we do show up and maybe we, to the outside world, look like we're fierce or like we're showing up, you know, in that kind of cancer warrior status doesn't mean that that's that the rest of us isn't falling apart. I like how you said that, that like you just, sometimes you just kind of feel like yeah. you're falling apart. You're just like a mess right. of wet and, noodles and it's like, and everywhere. I think some of us are just naturally tough warriors. That's how we were born. We came into this world, like ready for the fight. And some of us weren't, I, I mean, I, I've never, I'm people who know me would, I'm kind of the least aggressive in your face guy. And I'm very pacifist when it comes, I'm always the one who wants to like talk it out and, I, I could never imagine getting so angry that I'd want to hit somebody. I just have never had that in me in my life. Maybe it'll happen, but it hasn't yet. So I just, that's my personality is to want to talk about it, to want to research about it, want to learn. And then I think the teacher side of me, part of that gets relieved by teaching others about it and talking about it and normalizing it. Like you can ask me whatever, I'm an open book and let's talk about my cancer. You don't have to be afraid to talk about it with me. That's fine. Um, and, and so that that's sort of how, I come, that's just sort of my personality of how I come from it. You're a cancer wizard. You're not there a cancer warrior. There we go. Warrior. Oh, I love that. Oh, my You're son's going to love wizard. the Harry Potter connection there. Yeah, I'm, I'm an absolute <laughs> nerd. My sister is, my sister's staying here with me. And if she could hear me, she'd be like, uh, did you seriously just bring Harry Potter into yeah, that interview? No, I did. Um, but I was also thinking Gandalf, like, you know, yeah. like, like a wizard, like, you're the wizard is teaching, but he's, I mean, mm-hmm. he's also very capable of fighting, but yeah. he's got a lot more going on. <laughs> yeah. Got a lot more going on than the guy with the sword in his hand. And um, I, I look at it too, that I, you know, I might not see myself as a fierce warrior or anything, but that doesn't mean I don't see myself as brave. I see myself as yeah. brave and courageous and tough. And I've been through a lot with this. Yes. And I deal with a lot every day, just with uncertainty and everything, but that other people would look at and go, wow, that's really brave and fierce that you do that. But I, it's just not the way I see it, you know, it, day to day, at least. Sometimes no, when I, I totally take a step understand. back, I see it, but um, <laughs> not in the moment. No, for sure. Well, Alec, as we kind of close out for this interview, is there anything you want to end on? Just like, I guess, I guess if really, if we could end on anything, if, if you were talking to someone like you who is newly diagnosed, maybe has a couple younger kids, teenagers, um, obviously like just living life and they've been blindsided by this, uh, what is... Maybe your your top two to three things you would tell someone who's newly diagnosed of what they should focus on and where they should like turn to for for resources, for help, for internal processing. Well, I think the number one thing is to be informed. So to make sure that once you get this diagnosis, you have a medical team you trust, you have you know a whole process in terms of insurance and medicine and everything that you feel good about moving forward. Um, obviously if you have a doctor, you don't trust this whole process is going to be a mess and you you need to, you need facts. And at the beginning, when you join the Facebook groups, they're so supportive and wonderful, but there's just a lot of information and it all sounds like you're going to die in a day. It all is overwhelming. You go on Google, get informed from people who know what they're talking about. Uh, My doctor said, don't go on Google, and I didn't. I'm so glad I didn't for the first month or two. I did not go on Google and look up anything ocular melanoma um, uh, until I I had an appointment with him later on. Um, So my first piece of advice would be to stay informed. And then my second piece of advice is me specific, so it's not going to work for everybody, but I... I be honest and straightforward. I, I, I don't hide any part of the disability I have now. I don't hide my diagnosis if it comes up. Um, I didn't sugarcoat it with my kids. I mean, they knew my kids were like seven and 13, I think when I was diagnosed and, you know, I did it in terms that were appropriate for their age, but I let them know, like, it's going to be pretty obvious. I have a giant bandage over my eye. I'm going to have surgery and I'm going to be bumping into things and, you know, it's going to be a little different. Um, and I was very straightforward and honest with my friends and family about what the prognosis was and what the, the situation would be and all that. Um, and then, you know, I think all the cliches are true. That's why they're cliches. I always tell my students that it's because they are true, but um, to really take stock of what's important to you and focus on those things. 
Um, because getting a diagnosis like this forces you to start thinking about what's the most important in your life. You don't know, do I have several years left? Do I not? Do I, you know, and you start taking stock of what's important. And for me, that was family and friends, my wonderful colleagues and students and my interest of staying healthy. And, you know, now this new cooking channel thing that I started. Um, so I would give them the advice to, to focus on the most important stuff. And that had, that means that some things that I used to be more interested in or used to put time into, I have let go. Um, and I don't focus time on those anymore. So, uh, I prioritized, I don't have time to do it all. So, um, and then to just take care of yourself and do what feels right. Everybody's going to have advice for you. They're all going to tell you, go vegan, go do this, go follow this doctor, go, you know, do that. Oh, you did that. Don't do that. Everybody has advice. It's like anything in life, raising children. Everybody has advice for you. Um, being a teacher, everybody has advice for me about how I could do a better job, but you know, you, so make sure yeah, you're I'm taking listening. care of yourself. Listening like to that, to that inner knowing and just trusting. And, and that's really, I mean, that, that can be such a hard thing to do, right? I think for some people it's a little harder than others, but, but learning to just ultimately to trust yourself yeah. and to trust, to trust you, to know you. And to know what you need, to know what kind of a doctor you need, uh, to know, you know, what kinds of people you need to support you and just, just to get better and better at listening and, and that self-awareness piece. Yeah, uh, the, It really is. It's a developed skill, I think, especially with a diagnosis like this. You reminded me too, you and I were talking off screen before we started about your doctors and that's, it's really important to make sure that you click with your doctor because we've all been to different doctors who have different styles, different personalities, different senses of humor, all that kind of thing. And, and it is so important to make sure that you click with your doctor. Um, that's the person that's going to be responsible for your health through this cancer for hopefully for the rest of your life. So it, it's, that's a big deal to make sure that you have uh, that medical team behind you that you trust. And you, I, I actually look forward to going to see my, my medical team, my ocular oncologist as like, I feel like I'm walking in and seeing a good friend now. Um, it's like a social visit and like, oh yeah, my eye. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We'll take care of that. I mean, I'm so lucky with that, but find that, you know, there are doctors out there that are going to give that to you. And that's, that just makes me feel more secure and uh, in, in that knowledge that I have somebody like that for me. I love that. Well, Alex, what would, or Alex, sorry, in my head, That's I've okay. called you Alex for Happens years all the time. and sorry, um, <laughs> just, just to know, or just as a, like a final ending note, um, what would you tell someone today who is kind of in that pit of despair? Just, you know, they're really down. Maybe I, I know the holidays can be a really triggering time yeah. for some people. Um, you know, because they remind us of, all of the questions that we have and all of the uncertainties that we face. But, um, what would you tell someone today if they're kind of in that place? Well, let's see. I would, I would let, I would tell them to just acknowledge that it's okay to be feeling that way. First of all, we're all, we're all allowed to feel the way we feel and we should not be judging ourselves for having a tough time over the holidays. Or I, I have a tough time at every major event that comes up in a birthday, a graduation or whatever, a, the thought goes into my head every single time. What if this is the last time I get to do this? What if this is the last time I get to see this? Um, and I feel pressure to take that all in. Um, but I would give the advice to somebody that it, it's that this is how you're feeling now and it gets better. You know, I, it, it, there is always something in my life that is on the other side of it. It might be a few minutes later. It might be a few hours, days. It sometimes has taken me a few weeks to get out of a funk that I've been in. I can think of one that went for a few months actually, um, where I just felt like, am I ever not going to feel scared and depressed about this disease? Like this is just overwhelming up all night. Um, it gets better. It, you know, you, something comes up every time to make, it, to make it better. Some, um, happy, joy, interesting, funny, silly thing will, will drop into my life and remind me, oh, that's why I'm, I'm here in life. This, that's, I'm supposed to be paying attention to that and not the sad, scary stuff. So, uh, my advice would be that. And my other advice would be, and I'm open about this too, is to make sure you find a really good therapist. If you're in those kinds of situations, I've, I've been in therapy several times in my life for different reasons. And particularly for something like this, my gosh, there's so much to talk about and to, to, to process through that even the people who love you the most aren't going to get, they're not going to understand and not be able to process it the same way. So if you're feeling that low and down for an extended period, for sure, go get some 
professional help and find someone you can talk to about it. Well, thank you, Alec. That was amazing. Um, well, I mean, I feel like honestly we could keep talking forever, yeah. but I just want to make sure that everyone knows how they can find you. So can you just run through your social media channels that people can find you and follow the one-eyed cooking guy? Sure. So you just said it. If they go to uh, any of the major social media, I am not a Snapchat guy. So that's where I draw <laughs> the okay. line. I'm, not on Snapchat. I'm like, yeah, the older, I, I, I can't figure it out. But I am on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. And if you go onto any of those social media and search for one eyed, E-Y-E-D, it's got a D at the end, one eyed cooking guy, you will see me pop up. It's a little cartoon guy of somebody with my glasses. Um, and you will find my cooking videos there and other content that I post, um, about ocular melanoma. Awesome. Well, Alec, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks we for will let you me. get back to your uh, rest of your week and happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. I appreciate it. I hope everybody has a great holiday. Bye guys. Wonderful. That was